my childhood was happy. There was lots of good memories. My parents loved us so much. We did a lot, we, we hiked a lot, we lived in the middle of the woods, I grew up in the country. It was always fun. I was a twin sister, I have a twin, and she was always more serious, and mom always told me that I was happy-go-lucky. It all seemed picture perfect for Megan Piper. Good family, good grades, and good friends. But one day out of the blue, this small town girl's life flipped upside down. My mom had this idea to move to Winnipeg because her sister lived out there and she said that dad could find better work and we moved a month later and we drove across Canada and landed in Winnipeg and um, that's when everything changed. So towards the end of the year, mom and dad could tell that, you know, my grades were um, suffering. I wasn't applying myself in school. I didn't want to go to school. I had begun stealing cigarettes from my dad, stealing weed from my dad. They didn't take lightly to it and they put me and Jade on a plane and sent us home and they sold the house. But coming home wasn't the answer. Something had already changed in Megan and her sister and it was about to get worse. I thought it was cool. People people called us smokers and you know, we were the always out in the snake pit smoking weed. We were rebels and I liked it. When I was 17, I met Scott. Ended up falling in love with him and moving in with him. Dropped out of school, got a job. Megan stopped caring about the things that were once important to her, her family, her grades, and what was worse, Megan stopped caring about herself. The first night that, that um, we hooked up, I snorted a line of coke and that was it. A month later, I was smoking crack. Megan didn't know it at the time, but she would chase that high for the next 10 years, her life already plunging into chaos. Chaos became comfortable. And I knew that to get out of the chaos, I'd have to work hard at it, and I'd have to change, and I'd have to, you know, put my faith and my hope in something other than myself or my drugs, and I just never wanted to do that. So I just adapted to my surroundings and became accustomed to them. On my 18th birthday, um, Mom gave us $100 each for our birthday, and we bought crack, and I gave Jade her first puff of crack, and she loved it. To come down off of crack, you need something to ease the, the effects. And those are the worst feelings, you know, when it's 6 a.m. in the morning and your boyfriend has to go to work and you have no oil in the furnace, it's freezing cold, all the crack's gone, all the money's gone, you don't have cigarettes, you don't have food, and your boyfriend's going to work. And I just remember mornings when he would leave to go to work. You know, I'd be so jonesed for crack. It's the worst feeling. And in those moments, I, I, would, I, was, I would always think, uh, I understand how people could do anything for this drug. And little to know, I know that I would. Things really began unraveling when her boyfriend Scott was arrested. Now Megan was lost, alone and desperate, to feel some sort of belonging and affection. She quickly moved on to another man who paid little attention to Megan. She found a way to get even which nearly cost her her life. I went downstairs in his room, and I dumped a lot of Coke in a spoon and did it up, and that's the last thing I remember. And I woke up in the ICU. Um, Jade called Mom, and they came into the, the city, and they told Mom that, they wanted, that she should think about pulling the plug. I can only imagine what my mom must have felt. This wake-up call led Megan and her sister into a recovery home, where it looked like she was turning the corner. I got a taste of recovery for the first time and I loved it. I loved the people and I loved the meetings and I loved listening to people who had been sober for, you know, 10, 20 years, right? And just the knowledge and the wisdom. And, but I wasn't ready and I knew in my mind that I wasn't ready. Within a few weeks, Jade and I had both moved back to the city. And um, yeah, we went right back to using. I remember the first time we smoked it again. And I just looked at her and said, I was very, very naive about it all and very, very stupid about everything. You know, rain or shine, it didn't matter. I had to get money and I had to get high. Things got really bad. Throughout my addiction, I spent a little over a year in um, the correctional facility in Burnside. Megan realized that she was no longer able to lean on her sister, who had sought help for herself and was now out of Megan's life. It was around this time that she turned from everyone and turned to the streets. I saw a friend and she looked at me and said, you're alive? We heard that you died. She looked at me like she had seen a ghost. And that was like, that was just crazy to me. Of course I'm alive. You know, but then it got me thinking, like, what am I doing? I haven't talked to my family in months, and, you know, my friends don't even know that I'm alive. They think I'm dead, you know? And I felt dead. I did. 
So I remember agreeing to go to detox. Yeah, I'll go to detox. And I remember having the application for Windsor Life Center. And I remember one of the nurses came in to the room and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm filling out the application to Windsor Life Center. I'm gonna go, you know? And she was like, good, go. Like she had done many times before, Megan decided it was time to get help. But unlike the past, this time there was real hope. Megan boarded a plane terrified, but hopeful that a small woman's center in Windsor, Ontario would be what she needed to start over. What she discovered was a God who loved her and gave her the sense of belonging that she so desperately wanted. I put what little faith I had in a God I knew nothing about, you know, and I think that's what he needs. I don't think he wants us to have any preconceived ideas or notions about him, and, and I certainly didn't. I knew that I couldn't do it myself anymore. And I completely surrendered to the process. I have learned so much. Firstly, that he doesn't expect perfection, which is settling, because I'm not perfect, and I never will be. Maybe that was why I never felt good enough for him in the past. But I know that he's unrelenting in his pursuit of our hearts, and that's all he really wants, and he'll chase us. He'll chase us to the bitter end. But he's never gonna give up on me, and even when I give up on myself, you know, he's never gonna stop loving me.